I was thinking of this word in which we, which Santosh read from the church in Laodicea. Please turn to Revelation chapter 3. What was the greatest lack in the church in Laodicea? Why did the Lord say, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. What is it that makes a person lukewarm? <clears throat> See, they were not worldly people saying, we never go to the church meetings, we have no interest in God. Uh, atheists and people who are nominal Christians, they are cold. Okay, we understand that. And uh, hot are those who are fervent for the Lord, baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, a fire that never dies. <clears throat> who are the lukewarm? Which category do you and I, I include myself. I never preach a word to another which I don't judge myself in. So <clears throat> which category do I come in? This is the test. The main thing which the Lord says to them, see, we can imagine that, uh, you know, when the Lord told the rich young ruler, give up all your money. There are people in the world who've given up their money. I know a lot of Hindus in India who they call them sannyasis, who've given up everything, go and live in the forest. They don't become spiritual. There are some in the Catholic Church who become monks and nuns who give up everything. Some of them are not even born again. So if it was, if I could go into heaven just by emptying my bank account, boy, that's an easy way to go there. Really. But what was it that made that rich young ruler miss out in the kingdom? What is it the most serious thing here in the church in Laodicea is, see, Revelation 3, he said to them, you say you're rich and you're wealthy. What is the mark of a man who is wealthy? Here's this expression. You say you have need of nothing. That's an expression I would encourage you to remember all your life. A lukewarm brother or sister is one who has no sense of spiritual need in his life. I've already come so far. I'm pretty good compared to the others. I have need of nothing. I'm in a good church. RLCF is not like these other churches. We can be boasting about these things. I have need of nothing. I've got good brothers. I've got a good family. My children are growing up well. I have need of nothing. I know the word. I'm not committing adultery. I'm not stealing. I'm paying all my taxes. I have need of nothing. Yeah, it's very sad when a person comes to that state. He's not cold. No, 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 he's not cold. He attends all the meetings, even the Zoom meetings online, and he never misses a meeting. But there's no sense of need in his life. And so he does not grow spiritually. I've seen in my own life that it's a very dangerous thing if I come to the place where I say I have need of nothing. I was born again 61 years ago, nearly 62 in a few months. But even today, I tell you, I say, Lord, there's so many areas I see. I'm not yet like Christ inside. My passion is to become like Jesus totally, particularly in the areas that nobody can see, where even my wife can't see. My inner attitudes, thoughts, motives, and everything to be totally 100% like Christ. My hope is not just that I will see Jesus face to face, but like it says in 1 John 3, I have this hope that I shall see him and become like him. That's the first thing. My hope is I will become like him. Have you noticed that? 1 John 3. Uh, 
It says in verse 3, 1 John 3, 3, a lot of Christians, you ask, what is your blessed hope? Almost 99.9% .9 of Christians will say, my blessed hope is that I'm going to see Jesus when he comes again. <clears throat> I used to say that. 1 John 3, 3, <clears throat> everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself, which is this hope. It's mentioned in the previous sentence. We know that when he appears, we will see him. No, that is second. When he appears, number one, we will be like him. Number two, we will see him. What is the greatest thing? To see him? How many, how many of us would say, oh, I wish I could see Jesus even now. I've had that longing. But I've seen from this verse, that's not the greatest thing. When Christ comes again, to me, the greatest thing will not be that I will see him. Numerous people saw him on earth when he walked. They touched him. They're in hell today. So my hope is not that I will see Jesus face to face. My hope is like it says here. When he appears, I will become exactly like him in my inside. That means you could search the inside of me in heaven and every part of me will be like Jesus Christ. Motives, thoughts, attitudes, everything, even the areas I don't know. And secondly, I will see him. Of course, I love to see him. I love to hug him. Kiss his hands and feet. But that's second. And if that is your hope, how do you know whether that's your hope? Well, now you understood the answer. Now, if you get a question answer paper, uh, what is your hope? You'll give the right answer now because you heard it today. <clears throat> Does it mean you understood it? No, not at all. <laughs> the test is, verse 3, you will purify yourself every day until you reach his standard of purity. Then you got the right answer, not just sticking. I'll be like him is number one. That's head knowledge. <clears throat> the test of whether you have this blessed hope is not picking the right answer that I shall be like him, but in your life, every single day, you seek to purify yourself as he is pure. And that is not possible if you say, I have need of nothing. God is using me. God is blessing me. God is doing so many things for me. He answers my prayer. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. So you have need of nothing? I feel sorry for you. Never let us say I have need of nothing. You know, it's a sad thing that we tell the people in the world. You must open your heart to Jesus. But we read in the church of Laodicea, it is to a church the Lord is saying, I stand at the door and knock. So it's exactly like Santosh said earlier. You can let the Lord inside your heart just like you allow somebody to come inside your home. For example, a guest comes and lives in your house. <clears throat> you don't let him into your bedroom. He's got his guest room and he stays there. You feed him, you clothe him, you make a grand meal for him, but he dare not come into your bedroom. He dare not open up your account books and check your finances. He'll say, mind your own business. We'll treat you like a good, respected guest, but don't interfere in all these things. So do you receive Christ as a guest or as head of your home? If he's head of your home, there should not be a single door where he has to say, I stand at the door and knock. I said, Lord Jesus, don't ever say to me, there's some door you're still standing outside and knocking. Please show me. It's, it's open to you. Anything. And I tell you, I've agonized and prayed and struggled in this area because I know the heart is deceitful above all things. The Bible says the flesh is deceitful. The Bible says Satan is a deceiver. But with all these deceptions, my only hope is if I love the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 and 11 says, If I love the truth about myself, God will not deceive me. That's a great comfort to me. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 and 11. If I love the truth, God will not deceive me. 
I will know whether there's a door in my heart to do that Jesus is still standing and knocking. And I tell you, this is an area, even I'm, I've been a believer, since I said 62 years, but I still seek the Lord. Lord, is there any areas, a small little corner perhaps, where you're not Lord of my life. I don't want to be. I will purify myself. When do I stop? On John 3, 3, as he is pure. Until that day, I will never say I have need of nothing. <clears throat> well, the other thing is Revelation, uh, Matthew 19. We were also looking at the rich young ruler. I just want to share something briefly from there. <clears throat> he felt he had even need of nothing. What am I still lacking? He says in Matthew 19, verse 20. I've done all this. Such a sense of satisfaction. Woe unto us uh, if we have that sense of satisfaction. <clears throat> yeah, I'm satisfied in the Lord. I don't want anything outside the Lord. But true Christianity, I've discovered, is a, a, what I call an attitude of dissatisfied satisfaction. If you can understand that. That's called a paradox. And the Christian life is a paradox. <clears throat> <clears throat> It's, I'm dissatisfied with, not yet fully like Christ, but I'm perfectly satisfied in the Lord, perfectly satisfied, my sins are forgiven, perfectly satisfied, I'm declared righteous by God, perfectly satisfied that God's working everything for my good, no complaints against a single human being in the world, not a single person I've not forgiven, not a single person whom I've hurt, whom I've not asked forgiveness from, my account is clean, absolutely clean, in every area that I know of. No bitterness against anybody. I think it is, God has worked a thing in my heart that it is now, by the grace of God, I can say it is impossible for me to hate anyone. Actually impossible. It's impossible for me to be bitter against anyone. It's not it's something I struggled with for years, but God's done a work in my heart. The Holy Spirit does a work in your heart. There are many other areas I've got to work on, but bitterness... Complaining, murmuring, gone, and uh, grumbling and um, discouragement, condemnation, all gone. But there are still many, many other areas. You know, the land of Canaan is huge. Many giants and little children of giants and corners that we've got to kill. I'm discovering them little by little. But so I will not go to say the Lord and say, what am I still lacking? I say, Lord, show me. I know I'm lacking in things. But what I want to say here is, listen to this. See the attitude of the disciples in contrast to the rich young ruler. <clears throat> they, in Matthew 19, Matthew 19 we read, when the young, you know, he said, uh, you've got to give everything to the poor, and that's not what I'm thinking of right now. Then Jesus said to his disciples, this guy had gone. And I have a feeling the disciples said, well, thank God, we are not leaving. We are still standing with Jesus. He said, it is hard for a rich man, Matthew 19, 23. It's hard, in one place he said, impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, those disciples were, maybe they had some amount of money as fishermen, but you know how fishermen are not, I mean, I've seen uh, fishermen on the coasts of India, they are some really pretty poor people. I mean, they have enough to earn their living. And they had given up even that to follow Jesus. Would you call those disciples at that time rich or poor? I mean, financially. They were definitely poor. They were already not such wealthy people. They were poor fishermen and earning their living and now they've given up even that. So when he said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, they could have said, oh, thank God we are not rich. But that's not what they said. That's what some of you may say. That's what some of us may say. Oh, thank God I'm not rich. But you know what they said? When Jesus said it's Easier for a camel, verse 24, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He should have said, thank God, we are not rich. That's why we followed you. They said, Lord, what about us? Will we be saved? That's their question. 
that question was, Lord, you know, I'm not a pauper. I'm not a homeless man begging for money. Peter, John, and Paul, and James and John, and all the others were saying, we're not homeless people. We've still got some amount of money. I've got a house back home, and I've got a family, and I've got a certain amount, little amount of money in my bank account. I'm not poor. That honesty. We are rich. I've seen a lot of believers who act poor. They were much wealthier than these disciples. It's that attitude, Lord, I'm not a homeless man. I'm not a beggar going out looking for a handout. I am pretty rich. I eat three meals a day. I can feed my children. Can I be saved? You said a rich man can't enter God's kingdom. How do you react when you hear that word? It's impossible for men. For a camel to go through the eye of a needle is impossible. It's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What is your reaction to that statement? Is it, oh, thank God I'm not rich. I'm going to enter God's kingdom. No, we are rich, my brothers and sisters. I would say that even to our brothers in India in the villages. Don't think you're poor. You're rich. You've got more than that homeless man. You've got a roof over your head. You're rich. Then how to enter God's kingdom? Because it's not a question of all this money. You know, let me just show you one example from the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 24. There's a time when, Rebecca, uh, when Abraham sent his servant Eliezer to Mesopotamia to find a bride for his son Isaac. And uh, his son came, uh, uh, his master, sorry, Eliezer went to that, the house of Rebecca and he said in verse 35, uh, Genesis 24, 35. Genesis 24, 35. The Lord has greatly blessed my master Abraham. He has become very rich. God has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants. He had 318 servants, by the way. 318 servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Boy. But you know, there was a day in Abraham's life when he became really poor and he remained poor thereafter. And that was the day he put Isaac on the altar and was ready to kill him. So wealth is not your bank account, whether you have one house or two houses, whether you have two cars or three cars. This has got nothing to do with wealth or whether you don't have some who are poor can you know, think, well, I'm not like that rich guy over there. I, I'm more in God's kingdom. You're deceiving yourself. I've seen a lot of people financially poor in India who are extremely rich, and that's why they can't get into God's kingdom. Abraham was very rich in all these things, but he became poor when he said, Lord, the most precious thing in my life, I lay it on the altar and I'll kill it to prove that I love you more than anything else. The man who is really poor is the man who values nothing in his life more than Jesus Christ and who is willing any day for the Lord to turn to give up anything. If you love father or mother or brother or sister or wife or children more than me, you're not worthy of me. If there's anything you possess, hang on to. You cannot be my disciple. If you open your palm and say, Lord, it's in my hand, but you can take it if you like. I don't possess it. I have it. We must possess nothing, even though we may have many things. You can have 318 servants and be a disciple of Jesus. But you possess that. Hang on to it. Then you become like that church in Laodicea. I have need of nothing. So let's be honest and say, Lord, I thank you that... You will continue to speak to me that I can be purify myself till I reach that standard of purity. I press toward the mark 
And Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind. It's not just our past sins that we can forget. It is our past successes. How much we have grown spiritually, forgetting it. There must be a curtain right behind my back. I look back, I can see nothing. My past must be like that. I can't see my successes. I can't see my failures. Forgetting the things that are behind, I press towards the future for the prize of becoming like Jesus. That is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus.